Welcome to Season 5 of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former health commissioner here in Baltimore, Maryland. Our goal with this podcast is to bring scientific evidence and experience to shed light on critical health issues. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health on Call, and today I'm speaking with journalist Beth Macy. Beth is the author of Dope Sick, Dealers, Doctors, and the Drug Company that Addicted America, which was made into a miniseries for Hulu. We talk about the current overdose crisis in America in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and solutions for how to curb the epidemic that's killed over a million people. We also talk about how this epidemic became personal for me just a few months ago. Let's listen. Beth Macy, thank you so much for joining us on Public Health On Call. So you are the author of Dope Sick, and today we're talking about what I was referring to as the opioid epidemic, and you were referring to it as the overdose crisis. So can we talk a little bit about um, the, the naming of it and how that changes things? Sure. When we first started talking about the over- overdose crisis, it sort of begins with the introduction of OxyContin and the big narrative shift that uh, pushed by Purdue and other makers that opioids were safe. And so that was the first wave of the crisis was really the painkiller opioid pill epidemic. Then when the pills got hard to get, we talked about the heroin epidemic. I mean, I basically, when I pitched the proposal for dope sick, I called it the heroin epidemic. And um, then that became kind of a fentanyl problem as that became easier to smuggle in because it's smaller and more potent. And now we have a lot of the overdose deaths driven by fentanyl, but also as it's laced in to things like cocaine and methamphetamine. And people don't know what's in there, a lot of cases. And so what we're really seeing now is an epidemic of polysubstance. So that's why we just say overdose epidemic, overdose crisis. So you wrote this book initially in 2018. Um, Can you talk a little bit about where things are today? We're talking about essentially an epidemic within this larger pandemic. So can you kind of catch us up to where the overdose crisis is right now? Sure. Um, In November of 2021, it made huge news that America had crested 100,000 overdose deaths. Uh, I think it was from April to April. And every month when they tally it up, I think they release the new numbers every three months, it goes up by three, 4,000 deaths. So during the pandemic, we did see a slight decline. I think it was in 19, but during the pandemic, um, overdose deaths have really shot up because of isolation, people using alone with no one to Narcan them. We still haven't really made services to scale treatment services, medication assisted treatment in particular to scale to match the crisis. And you have fentanyl deaths just getting worse and worse. And knowing what we know about how these deaths are counted, you know, this might be a huge underestimate. Is that correct? Absolutely. So I went back using the CDC's wonder data and um, kind of with Don Burke at the University of Pittsburgh checking my math. And I actually have a little thing here on my board of every year since OxyContin came out in 1996, there were 13,481 overdose deaths. And you see the number just goes up, 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 up to to 2020, 100,306. I mean, there's some huge jumps in there along the way. But when you add them all up, it's a million forty four thousand five hundred and twenty eight. And that doesn't even... A lot of overdoses don't get counted because of shame and stigma. People don't want to call the police. The medical examiners are overloaded. But also it doesn't count suicide, addiction-adjacent suicide, hepatitis C, which is skyrocketing, and now HIV, which we're seeing as being a huge problem. So I dare say it's uh, probably twice as bad as we think it is. And it's, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. When I ran these numbers by Don, who's been studying this epidemiological curve, I said, when's it going to double? And he said, it's going to double by 2029. It's going to be 2 million 
counted deaths by 2029, unless we do something significant. And that's what we're not doing. We're not, as a society, doing anything significant. Um, it, and we can talk about that uh, specifically. I have a new book coming out in August called Raising Lazarus, and it's really about how we need to go to people on the margins who aren't engaged in care and try to get them into our systems of care. And can you talk about more, you know, what do we need to do to, to prevent getting to these, these absolutely mind boggling numbers? Right. So um, we have 5 million people with opioid use disorder in America. That number is often underreported as 2.1. But when you look at the, uh, when you really dig down into it, uh, people who are on the cutting edge of this think it's between four and six million. So I've been saying five million. And um, only about 10% of them in the last year have gotten access to treatment. So we've got a 88 to 90% treatment gap in the country. We know that to, to start to wind back overdose deaths, we've got to make uh, access to medication-assisted treatment, buprenorphine and methadone, um, to scale to match the scale of the crisis. And, and we're not doing that at all. So most people, like they run against uh, monetary barriers, waiting lists for doctors. One easy thing, I mean, I say it's easy. It involves some imagination at the federal level at the office of ONDCP, we need to get rid of that X waiver that requires doctors to have eight hours of training to dispense buprenorphine. They don't have to have eight hours of special training to dispense OxyContin or Lortab or Percocet. Why do they need special training to dispense um, the medications for the addiction caused by those um, earlier painkillers? So, um, I mean, you can go back and study the war on drugs and see how maintenance drugs have always been stigmatized um, as part of an outgrowth of that because, because we stigmatize users and people who are addicted. Um, and, and that's what it comes from. But with the deaths so out of control right now, we really need to do some radically different things. And that's just low-hanging fruit, MAT, low-hanging fruit. And I do want to ask you to define MAT. Yeah, MAT is medication-assisted treatment. Uh, it's the gold standard of care for opioid use disorder. Uh, the more current way to phrase it is medication for opioid use disorder or MOUD. Um, I usually say MAT because I've been saying that for the longest, but I had a researcher stop me in a talk I was giving once. She said, no, just call it medicine, the way we would call insulin medicine for a diabetic. And, th and that really got my attention. Um, so we know that people are 68% uh, less likely to die from overdose if they have access to MAT. And that to me seems like low hanging fruit. So does um, needle exchange, which we know people are five times more likely to eventually get into treatment if we first meet them where they are, which is they're still using drugs. There's some incredible drug users in America that are helping, they're organizing their own communities, they're helping people get access to hepatitis C and HIV treatment. I mean, we should listen to them. They know what they need. And I also want to go back to something you said previously about um, the overdose crisis, because this crisis has sort of morphed into, you know, we talk a lot about substance abuse, but like, for example, like I lost my brother in August to an overdose because he was recreationally using cocaine with some friends that happened to be laced with fentanyl. And so in addition to this ever-growing issue of substance use disorder of, you know, there's a mental health aspect you now have all these other people that you said are, and I'm trying to remember the word poly, there was a word that you used. Poly substance users. Poly user. substance users. So, so what can we do to address that, this growing population of people that are um, maybe not what you would think of as like, you know, needing a overdose prevention site or needing long-term um, medication? What can we do about that part of the crisis right now? I mean, exactly what you're doing. It's all about education, right? And prevention. 
Um, we should also be working harder to, you know, stop fentanyl from coming into the country. Um, but I think education, um, I mean, when I was growing up, we experimented with beer and marijuana and that was pretty much it. I mean, I grew up in a small town and I mean, there wasn't even pills when I was growing up. I'm in my mid fifties, but I'm sure if I had been growing up 20 years later, I would have experimented with those, those drugs as well. And so it's, it, it, it's, it really is like um, Russian roulette for people who are experimenting these days. And so we've got to get the word out. It's hard to even get attention for the overdose crisis because it's been going on for so long now, um, which is why I'm so proud of the Hulu show, Dope Sick because it has broken through the noise. Uh, you know, there's so much news about the pandemic, the insurrection, I mean, you name it. There's a lot of news out there, um, but we've just crested a million deaths. That's more people than have been killed by COVID. And the, the, to me, the big benefit of the show, um, it's hard to see the story when it's happening around you. And it's sort of this slow simmering story that begins in 1996 and comes up to now and it morphs and still continues to grow. It's very sneaky in that way. But the show takes it and in eight hours of television reduces it to something that is both entertaining and really, really educational. So going into the show, my goals were one, not stereotype Appalachia like Hollywood usually does. And I think we accomplished that. And two, get the message out about treatment. Um, I, you know, when we were writing the show, when the show was being approved, being purchased, we weren't really talking about um, experimental users dying of fentanyl. I mean, this thing is just morphing and shifting. And, but it's, it's so important why we need to continue putting the focus on this overdose crisis. Because um, a recent Gallup poll coming out late last year showed that a fully a third of American families have, have been now impacted, have been seriously impacted by the drug crisis. And, and, and your family, sadly, now being one of them. And we're all going to be impacted if we don't really start to do something to turn it around. And so one of the questions that I had for you, so first of all, uh, it's interesting that the series comes out in the midst of, you know, this global pandemic where so many resources and so much attention is being put into, you know, um, a very, very serious health crisis. Um, do you feel I, I know that both COVID and the overdose crisis are crises of a lot of things, right? There's a lot of things that that cause them to happen. Um, I think with with the overdose crisis, one is a crisis of accountability, and you also talk about a crisis of compassion. And so, can you talk a little bit about what you see now? You know, we can we can talk about the uh, recent uh, Purdue Pharma um, settlement that happened in December, um, that decision, and we can also talk about you know some other maybe signs of accountability that. That are happening and how that affects where we are today. Um, and then also the fact that the, the series focuses on individual humans, because I think we do tend to get very overwhelmed by these huge numbers. And we forget that every single one of those numbers is a human being with a family and a life. And the show does a really good job of humanizing this issue. So let's go to the accountability question first. Do you see signs of accountability right now? And if not, you know, what do you see happening? Well, if you had asked me this six months ago, I would have been very pessimistic about it. But as you say, we did have that uh, appellate judge rustle up some courage and call the naked emperor out and say, what? We're letting Purdue Pharma, uh, which files for bankruptcy in the rare jurisdiction in our country that allows third party releases, which is super wonky, by the way. John Oliver said, if you want to do something evil, bury it in something boring, which is exactly what they did with their lawyers who were billing $1,800 an hour. Uh, they file for bankruptcy in White Plains, New York, where they have no business, but they get a post office address, file for bankruptcy. 
uh, because that's the place where there's one bankruptcy judge who favors third party releases. And that means that the Sacklers could get the benefit of the bankruptcy and get all their litigation uh, forestalled from them um, without being bankrupt. We know they have billions of dollars and a lot of that money is hidden in offshore accounts. It's hard to get. Yes. Um, and so where it was when this judge, Colleen McMahon, this appellate judge said, nope, I'm not going to do it. Um, the Sacklers had agreed to give up Purdue Pharma um, and $4.5 billion of their wealth. Now, right before they filed bankruptcy in the years leading up to this, they strategically drained $10.4 billion from it. So we know they have at least that much. And um, a lot of the activists and families of the dead that I follow believe that all that money, they should have to give all the money they made off this drug because they are uh, that company is recidivist criminals. They have pleaded uh, guilty twice to criminally misbranding the drug in 2007, which is the subject of our show, largely, and again in 2020. And now, if this case doesn't um, uh, get fully overturned, because they're appealing it to the next level, of, of course, and it could go to the Supreme Court, we don't know. Um, they'll get away with it for a third time. So that's like one system for all of us and one system for billionaires. And that's just not fair. And I think the American public is really sick of that. Let's also talk about this crisis of compassion. Um, what's the context here for that? When I think about the crisis of compassion, I have this scene in my new book. It's in a federally qualified health center in a distressed community in a small town in North Carolina. And there's a peer recovery coach who's trained. She's in recovery herself from methamphetamine addiction. She chooses to work at the front desk of this FQHC. Why? Because people who are coming in for SUD treatment are so, I mean, you just see the, they're so, the, the first timers, they're so hang doggy looking. They are beaten down. They are literally living on tents under bridges and they borrow cars to get there. And what she does is she meets them with kindness and compassion and says things like, how can I help you today, honey? And gives them her direct phone number and sets them up with a provider who, when they can't get to their next appointment, will go to them. That's what we call low barrier care. And that is going to that's going to have to be what we do uh, if we're going to reverse our life expectancy decline in this country. Because people have been stigmatized for so many years because, as Richard Sackler once told everybody, you got to hammer the abusers. We have hammered and stigmatized people who use drugs. But we have to figure out ways to get to them in order to reverse these overdose deaths. And so harm reduction is the model that I think does this best. Uh, so for my new book, I've been following HIV outreach workers who are going into tent encampments to help people with testing and treatment. And eventually, when they're ready, get them into some low barrier MAT. But that's just like less than 1% are, are actually getting that kind of care, right? Because they have so many needs. They need help with housing, food, and transportation, and all manner of things. And a lot of these communities, so many families have been harmed by the opioid crisis that they just can't get beyond the hammer of the abusers. You know, their, their loved ones who use drugs have ruined weddings and Thanksgivings and um, there's just a lot of anger and a lot of one, one harm reduction worker said, we all need therapy. And I couldn't agree more. You know, it's really a crisis of, of untreated mental health. And that's where we've got to start. So let me ask you, what do you most want people to take away at this moment in the overdose crisis? That whatever you think you know about it, it's worse. But also, we know how to make it better. We're just not doing it to match the scale of the crisis. And we're not doing it with compassion. We're just casting people aside like, like lepers. And we need to have imagination in our leadership. There's so many regulations around 
prescribing MAT. One of the good things to come out of COVID is that they did away with, um, you have to go to the office the first time to get on buprenorphine. Now you can do that over telehealth. I mean, that's been great, but it's temporary. So we need to make that other things we can do to make it more accessible. Um, you know, of course, Medicaid in every state would be great. The Medicaid expansion in every state, that's a political non-starter as is. But um, getting rid of the special waiver we talked about so that every doctor could prescribe it. Getting rid of patient caps. Addiction psychiatrists that have, have experience can prescribe up to 275 patients. We have no patient caps on how many people can be prescribed OxyContin or Lortab. You know, we need to get rid of that. All the things that stigmatize MAT need to be done away with. It's, it's not a cure-all. It doesn't work for everyone the first time. People are still going to relapse, but we've got to continue to envelop them and get them into systems of care. Beth Macy, thank you so much for all of your work and for being on Public Health On Call. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it, Lindsay. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker, Matthew Martin, Spencer Greer, and Holly Cardinal, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez. Thank you for listening.